everyone, and welcome to another exciting edition of the Human and Sports Performance Series. I'm your host, Anthony Smalls, and today we have a goodie. We have Dr. Miriam Zachary, who works for the Team USA Department on fencing. She is a sports medicine physician who is with the Medical Director for Downtown Rehabilitation and Human Performance, Director of Running Medicine, and Chief Medical Advisor of the Team USA Fencing. So she has a lot of great material. I hope you enjoy it. Dr. Zachary, take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Anthony. So uh, I was asked to speak on working with an Olympic team, which is a really fun part of my job, mostly. Uh, so we're going to go through the fun parts, the parts that are hard work, how to get there, and some of the experiences that I've had with the team in reverse order. Um, so I am an assistant professor here at Mount Sinai. I am a sports medicine interventional spine doc, and I'm the chief medical advisor for USA Fencing. And I know that you guys have heard from some of my colleagues who also work with the fencing team and other sports teams. Um, and I'm very, very lucky to be working with them as well. So who am I? So I'm first generation American. My family came over in the 80s from Egypt. I was born and raised in New Jersey. I know plenty of you will have jokes about that, but I am proud of it. I was in a seven year medical program out in Long Island for undergrad, and I ended up going to Rowan SOM, which is a New Jersey medical school. And I did my residency at Mount Sinai. I did my sports medicine fellowship at Mount Sinai, and I stayed on as faculty and they cannot get rid of me. My first involvement in performance medicine was through our performance 360 program. It works with athletes and weekend warriors and people who want to optimize their performance. Uh, by doing different exercise testing, working with different um, nutritionists, orthopedic surgeons, uh, exercise physiologists, um, and physical therapists to kind of treat any injuries they might have or prevent them from becoming injured if they're high-functioning athletes. Through that program, I got involved with uh, our entire sports medicine team uh, in USA Fencing. I became a medical director downtown for my site and I look for any excuse to put a picture of my puppy in my slideshow. So I am also a dog mom and there he is. All right, so fencing. Let's talk about a little bit of the history of it. It is kind of a historic sport. So I think that it's important. Um, so it's rooted in development of swordsmanship for duels and self-defense. So back in the day, there was an issue. You solved it by a duel. And you see a picture here of two people dueling, and that's how they solved their problem. So the oldest records of fencing were from Spain. And through conquest, it was brought to Italy. And it was in Italy where they started looking at the mechanics of modern day fencing and looking at the different movements and the rules and um, you know what we know fencing to be today. So we could thank the Italians for that. During the mid 18th centuries, there was a shift from it being part of military training, if you will, because again, this was a combat type sport, to making it more of an aristocratic and kind of fashionable sport. Um, and it was, this movement was led uh, by a fellow in London. And they wanted to use it, they used it then to emphasize health and sporting benefits versus making it a killing art. So I, I think that was a good shift. They took it from the goal of killing each other or wounding each other to an exercise in a sport. So in 1800, it became an official sport by a French fencer, uh, Camille Pravost. And around the same time, fencing was established and recognized in all of Europe and America as a sport. We haven't made it to the Olympics quite yet. trying to progress my slides and there we go. So the first fencing competition was held in London in 1880 between army officers and soldiers. And they used black paint on the tip of their weapon to mark each other and judge for scoring. So whoever had the most black paint on them lost, they got hit the most. So it's important to note here, the rules of fencing or dueling before it became a sport. There are three different weapons in fencing. There's the epee, the foil, and the saber. Saber fencing, which is the quickest and most aggressive these days, um, was done on a horse. So the target is anything waist up because you wanted to harm your opponent, but you wanted to take their horse after you won. So you don't want to hit below the waist. 
For Epe, the target is anywhere on the body because to win that duel, all you have to do is draw blood. So you could draw blood from their foot, their neck, their hand, it doesn't matter. So it's an open target. For foil, you have to strike to kill. So it, imagine where all your vital organs are, kind of in the thorax, that's your target. And that remained through the sport of fencing as well. Through those three weapons, those are still till this day, the targets for all three. So it's kind of neat that they took something so ancient, made it into a sport, and you're playing the same sport of fencing with significantly different rules amongst the weapons. So the first time that fencing became part of the Olympics was the Summer Olympic Games in 1896. And here we are now, it is a very well-known Olympic sport. We actually, USA took gold in women's foil this year and bronze in men's team foil. So uh, we're on the radar for fencing and that's kind of cool. So where do I come in? How did I get involved in all of this? So in 2021, we resumed qualifying games for the Olympics. So leading up to the Olympics, the way that you make it there, you compete in different games around the world and within your own country as well. You gather up points. If you get enough points, you make it to the Olympics. 2020 COVID happened and all of this was paused, right? The Olympics themselves were canceled at that time or paused, I should say. In 2021, March of 2021, they resumed qualifying events. So the first event that happened was in March of 2021 in Budapest and over to the left of the screen, the men and women Sabre World Cup, that's picture of me in Budapest. So Mount Sinai became the official providers because they needed doctors to travel with them during COVID. There was so much unknown. So they needed a medical provider to travel internationally with them. So on that first qualifying event, I was the provider that was assigned to that trip. It was scary. There was a lot of unknown, but we got it done. There's a lot of exposures, a lot of positive tests, and that's the beauty of sports medicine. You go in expecting anything and you're trained and prepared to deal with anything. So through this slide, I added some, th the different trips that I've taken with the team from left to right. Uh, that's me in Budapest. Then there's me standing with the director of sports med in Cairo. Um, beneath that, when you see a, a group of four people, that's in Columbus, Ohio. To the right of that, that's in Philadelphia. Right above that, all the way to the right, that's in Dubai. And that was my latest international trip for uh, junior uh, world championships. And then above that was my latest trip, summer nationals in Minneapolis. Some trips more exotic than others. Uh, so it was really, really, really gratifying working with the team during that year in 2021, because we did absolutely anything and everything to get them on a flight to Tokyo, COVID free, ready to go, you know, healthy. So seeing them out there um, competing was a win in its own. So the fun and games, right? I promised you guys it was fun and games mostly. Fun and games comes with, you know, I look at this slide and I just see standing on the podium with your athletes who you've helped get there while they wear their gold medal. Uh, all the travel that comes along with it. A lot of fun exploring different parts of the world. Making friends with your team, um, whether it's the chiropractors, the athletic trainers, and we'll talk more about my team in a little bit. You know, these are lifelong friends that you're traveling with. You bond with them because it's some of the hardest times and um, you share a goal. You're all there to treat these athletes. You're all there to get them up on the podium and you share that medal with them. You know, there's pictures up here of me with my fellows. So we have sports medicine fellows that we get to take with us on these trips and teach and uh, collaborate with them. And bottom right hand corner, getting to go out with your team again and exploring different places. So the fun and games. And then here, to add to the fun and games, you get to peak your skills in the sport as well. I have a video to show off here. And that is my one trick I know how to do with a fencing saber. All right, we don't have to watch that again. So fun and games mostly. Here comes what we actually do and why we're there um, and what we do both strip side and what we do in the office. So. Here you can see I'm evaluating someone strip side for an injury using ultrasound. Fun little tool that we get to use both in and out of the office. Um, in the office, we do different imaging, x-rays, MRIs to evaluate and treat patients. And then right down there on the right-hand corner, I, I think this is fun, but can be a little scary is when we're covering an event and we have different what we call strip calls. So if somebody goes down on the strip while they're fencing, the strip is that metal 
strip uh, that they fence on, we get a call from the referee to run over and evaluate them. So really got to think on our feet. And like I said before, you have to prepare for anything. So we run over with our sports bag, not knowing what we're going to walk into. And it's both, it's exciting and scary, you know, but you trust your training, you go out there and you do what you got to do. These strip calls are uh, similar, both for national and international events. To give you guys an idea, at our uh, national events here in the United States, there are events that go up to 5,000 fencers and you have 98 bouts that could be going at any given minute, right? So our team is on our feet and ready to go every second. And I'd say we'd get a strip call and Dr. Parisian could correct me if I'm wrong. We get a strip call at once at least every 10 minutes. So we're doing that. We're also back in the medical tent, taking care of our athletes there, taping them up, evaluating them like you see to the left of the screen um, and treating them for their injuries. So let's get a little serious. What's it actually like? Being a team physician, you're on call for your athletes every need. If you ask any team physician, they'll tell you, the minute your athlete trusts you, there's no getting rid of them. So they're not gonna go to you for just their musculoskeletal and orthopedic injuries. They're gonna go to you if their stomach hurts, if you know they have a rash, if they have things completely unrelated to musculoskeletal medicine, they only trust you. I've had people come to me with their family members to treat them and their you know, classmates. And it's, it's building a bond with these athletes that is very hard to break, whether you like it or not. So that is uh, the first and ultimate step of being a team physician is creating that bond, creating that trust, having them trust you. Um, and treating them and being ready to treat their every need. So again, you're their primary point of care for them. And what that means is you're the quarterback when we're coordinating and collaborating with several different specialties on the team. So as the physician, I work with athletic trainers. I work with sports chiropractors, physical therapists, sports psychologists, and team managers. And it's important that each of these people communicate with the physician what's going on with an athlete at any given time we all add our value to the team. There is not one person more valuable than the other. Never do I think I am the physician, therefore I know better than anyone on this team. They in fact know better than I do in several circumstances. And that's a very, very important part of being a sports medicine uh, physician and lead on a team with high level athletes. It is dangerous for the athlete for one person to think they know it all. Every single one of these disciplines is extremely important and valuable to the sports medicine team taking care of these athletes. Um, you know, there's one saying, one of our, our director of innovation, Dave Petrino, and, and he'll speak to you guys as well, always says, if there's trash on the ground, anybody could pick it up, right? Nothing is beneath us. Whatever needs to be done, it doesn't matter if you're the doctor, you're the sports psychologist, you're the physical therapist, if you can help, if you can get this athlete better, you do it. Nothing is beneath us. So another huge, role of ours is dealing with emergencies both at home in our offices and our clinics and on the road. We have to have on the road something called an emergency action plan. So anywhere we land, it doesn't matter what country, what state we're in, we have to come up with a plan, which includes knowing where the closest trauma hospital is, knowing the provider that's there in the emergency room, calling them and telling them, hey, we're holding this event here with thousands of people. And if anything happens, I'd love to be able to call you and talk it out with you. Knowing everything in the venue down to where is the closest exit? Is that closest exit wide enough for a wheelchair to go in? Is there an elevator? Is everything wheelchair accessible? What Do I have crutches? What happens if someone can't walk and we don't have crutches or a wheelchair? So your emergency action plan needs to include absolutely everything that can go wrong and what we will do to rectify it. So that's dealing with emergencies on the road. And at home, you're dealing with emergencies that come up with our athletes, you know, um, their health, any injuries, whatever it may be. One example that is, of course, fresh in all our minds is COVID. So I remember leading up to Tokyo at one of our fencing clubs here, two people had COVID and we had to do an entire, we had to do exposure interviews to every single one of our athletes who was going to Tokyo because they were exposed to their teammate who had COVID, their coach who had COVID. Um, and that was a, that was a very stressful time because imagine telling someone who has worked this hard to get to the world stage, to the Olympics that, hey, you just tested positive for COVID and I don't think you're gonna be able to go. 
So our main goal is to do everything we can to get these athletes cleared and playing from any injury or COVID, um, but to make sure that it's done safely. So those are some, that's an example of some emergencies at home. And then some of the other challenges you face are the not so fun parts. In my opinion, fun, I do like these two things, are becoming comfortable with things you may not have been comfortable with prior. What do I mean by that? So like I said, they're gonna come to you with all of their ailments. They're gonna come to you when they're sick with anything. I wasn't trained in how to treat you know, gastrointestinal issues, but I better get comfortable with it because they're gonna come to me with that too, not just if they hurt their shoulder, their knee, their hip. Um, you know, getting comfortable treating emergencies, getting comfortable treating people outside of the office on the strip side in a medical tent, getting comfortable treating without the equipment I usually have or my medical assistant or all of the resources I have within the office. I need to get comfortable doing this outside of the office and it's kind of fun. The other thing that you have to do that's really important, we talked about establishing your relationship with your athletes, but you need to have one with your coaches, your separate team members. So um, if you look at the picture on the bottom left, that picture includes my, of course, my athletes. You guys see them there with the medal. Really proud of them. You have an athletic trainer there, a team manager. You have a team captain. We have two coaches. You have your armor, someone who is in charge of uh, making sure their weapons are um, up to regulation and compliant. But you might say, why do you need to be have a relationship with the armor? So as you imagine, each of the weapons has a grip. If that grip is too long, too short, too wide, they start to get hand injuries, abrasions on their hands, cuts, right? So what do I do? I go to my armor and say, hey, this person's gripping too tightly because you know it's too wide of a handle. Can you shave it down for them? This is just to say that, again, every single team member, it's important for you to have a relationship with them to provide the best care for your athletes, especially at this elite level. So going on, you want to also have a relationship with parents. Parents need to trust you for treating minors and treating their children, right? Um, a lot of times they're going to be the people at home making sure they do what you ask them to do, the athletes. And then lastly, the officials, the referees, the bout committee, um, all the officials that are there, they're the ones that your eyes and ears out as the bouts are happening. They're the ones that are going to call medical strip calls. And again, these are just several pictures of the team. You can see how extensive our team is. Um, and it really does take a village to take care of these athletes. Um, but a lot of fun, a lot of fun establishing these relationships. They're really, really strong relationships. Um, you know, and I, and I feel like I've made lifelong friends regardless of where the sponsorship goes. So what's it take? How do you get here? How do you work with an Olympic team? I think I got lucky, but the way that I uh, fell into this luck is first making it to becoming a sports medicine physician or a sports medicine provider. The way you do that, first you work on your college degree. So you either in college do pre-medical requirements, do pre-medicine or do another, you could always do another, um, get a, have another major, pardon me, and make sure you have your pre-medical requirements. And that would be leading up to medical school. But another way that you could do that is, or become a provider for a sports team is through uh, getting your mass, getting your, I'm sorry, degree in athletic training, followed by certification to become a certified athletic trainer. Then there's graduate school. If you did decide to go the pre-med route, uh, you can go to MD or DO school, medical school, or you can go to chiropractic school. And I work with a lot of sports chiropractors in USA Fencing. After medical school, you'd have to do specialty training. You can do your residency in either physical medicine rehab. That's what I did. You do in primary care, which includes family medicine and internal medicine. You can do a residency in emergency medicine. And no matter what you do out of those, you would follow it up with a sports medicine fellowship, which is one more year of training to specialize in sports medicine. You would take your board exam for all of these specialties and become board certified in your primary residency as well as sports medicine after your fellowship. If you decide to go to chiropractor school after that, you'd have to do a residency in sports medicine as well. I believe that's about two years. And some people choose not to do their sports medicine residency, though I highly recommend it. And they could sit for something called your sports diplomat exam. And that also certifies you to be a sports chiropractor. So this is 
the route that it takes through education to work with uh, an Olympic team or any high level uh, team. What else does it take? Lots of hard work. I'm sure you guys looked at that slide and in itself, it looks intimidating. It takes a lot of hard work. You've got to stay determined. A lot of grit, some creativity. You've got to be good with teamwork and you've got to have people skills. The number one thing I think I do is quarterback my entire team. I keep them together. I communicate with all of them. And I make sure that all of us are on the same page of providing the best care we can to these really, really high level athletes. So I'm going to end this with a, one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite athletes, Pele. Success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and most of all, love of what you are doing or learning to do. And I love what I do. And that's why for me, it's mostly fun and games. It is such a great opportunity. I would recommend it to anyone blindly. It is, in my opinion, the best field in medicine. And you'll hear all of us say that I'm sure about what we do. Um, and I am so happy to get the opportunity to share it with you guys. And any questions from you guys about my experience, about medical school, about residency, anything at all, I'm here to answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Zachary. So at this time, I will allow anybody in the crowd to come off mute or raise their hands or uh, anything to ask questions. Please feel free to do so. If there is none, I have a question. You mentioned that um, when you're working with these athletes and Team USA said that you tend to have this connection or bond or they, they rely on you a lot. Does that just something that occurs on the competition level or is that something that you extend outside of the competition? So great question. De definitely extend it outside the competition. So we see them in the office. We do procedures for our athletes there in the office. Um, all of my national team members, because they're the highest level, the one, the Olympians, um, since they're traveling a lot, they have my cell phone number. If something happens abroad, they won't talk to someone there with them. They'll call at home and say, Hey, this is going on. What do you think I should do? And again, uh, they come to the office. They, a lot of them we've actually mentored into medicine. They're all going to medical school. So it even extends outside of medicine, that relationship and that trust, um, you know, Dr. Parisian and I do a lot of medical research with them, the ones that are either in or applying to medical school. Um, so yeah, it extends far beyond competition. I would say a lot of times that's where it starts because it's in their most vulnerable moment. They're competing and they'll do absolutely anything to get back onto that strip, you know, get those points to get them to Paris now, uh, to the Olympics. So uh, that's where it starts a lot of times if not in the office, and then it extends well beyond that. Another question I had is, um, by any chance, did you uh, play any sports in high school or college? I and did. if you did, or, oh, so you did, so if you did, how would, how was the workload of managing your athletic career versus your medical career? Um, believe it or not, when I played, when I was in season, I was way better with my time management. I played basketball uh, growing up. That was my sport. Uh, and when I was in season, I knew, you know, I had practice every day. I had drills, I had workouts that I needed to get to. So I needed to be very structured with my schedule. I knew I had to fit in studying. I knew I had to fit in, um, you know, class and getting my work done. And I would say the same in medical school. I played on intramural team. There's no medical school basketball team. Um, and same thing when I knew during the week that I had a game coming up or, you know, this day of the week is blocked off for practice with the team. I, I was really structured with my schedule. It forced me to be structured. And I think that uh, it's doable as long as you plan well. So make sure you schedule. I used to schedule everything down to, I will complete three chapters from this hour to this hour. And then I will do 25 questions from this hour to this hour, you know, plan in my dinner then my workout and whatever. And I know before bed, I'm going to read another chapter. Um, so that's key. Key is time management. Um, and once you've got that down, it's uh, sports will keep you on your feet and I think can add to your success. I don't think it takes away from it in any way. 
while you were in college playing um playing sports and trying to handle your academics, did you receive full support from coaching and family, or was there any pushback at any point that kind of made you think twice about this career path? So funny you asked that. So I was in a seven year medical program, as I had mentioned. We took twenty one credits a semester, which was intense, and we weren't allowed to play sports. I somehow made it onto the basketball team and went under the radar for three months until I was caught and told I couldn't do it. See, and I like to admit that I'm a rule breaker sometimes because very often I'm not. Um, so it, in that aspect, I didn't get support, but uh, fam family's always been super supportive. Everyone thought I was out of my mind uh, at every point in my career with taking on, always being involved in sports, um, always being involved in community service and extracurricular activities, and taking on a full load of school, whether it be college or medical school. Everyone thought I was nuts, but I always had their support. Um, there were naysayers though. So people that maybe didn't hinder me, that didn't offer their support and really didn't think that it was I was capable of doing what I did, not me per se, but didn't think that it was the best idea. Um, while you know my coaches, and especially in high school, my coaches were, very supportive and saying, you know, you have to, they were the ones who taught me you have to add structure. I, you know, what you do inside the classroom is more important than what you're doing on the court because you'll lose your spot here if, if you don't succeed in the classroom. So they taught me that success was, you know, multifactorial. It wasn't, I couldn't just succeed in one thing and fail in the other because the entire umbrella will just crumble there. I see we have a question from Isaiah. By any chance, Isaiah, can you come off mute and just ask your question directly? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes. Great. Yeah, I was wondering uh, how you went about developing connections and also just gaining experience in the field um, while you were in medical school. Sure. So medical school is structured. You have two years, which are your more academic years, and this is the traditional, I know some med schools have different things, but two years we were in the classroom, you're doing a lot of book learning, a lot of test taking, even though it feels like we're always taking tests. The second two years are clinical years. Your third year, you're gonna do core rotations that you have to do like internal medicine and cardiology and ICU and all that stuff. Then your fourth year, you have a lot of elective time usually. So you get to rotate through whatever you're interested in applying to. So I did a lot of physical medicine rehab rotations and had a lot of exposure there, not just to sports medicine. So we do things like brain injury, stroke, spinal cord injury. Um, on those rotations, I developed my connections within the rehab world, um, you know, made my impressions on the places that I was going to apply for residency. And then it was through residency that we actually have a lot of sports coverage opportunities at Mount Sinai and in a lot of places, especially in New York City. So I started covering sideline football um, for um, two high schools in the Bronx. I started working with our sports medicine fellows with Medgar Evers, which is a D3 college um, in Brooklyn, to do pre-participation evaluations. So um, for our athletes in here, before you compete you have to have that form filled out by your doctor I started doing some of that uh, and just any opportunity I had to do any sports coverage I took that opportunity um, and did it and developed connections that way or more importantly I learned how to develop connections during that time and I learned the importance of doing so um, and I think that really built my ability to work with the team establish connections make connections with different um teams but if you're asking specifically how did i make connections to work up to working with an olympic team um like you saw on the first slide i'm a lifer here at mount sinai so i did my residency and fellowship here i was kept on by dr herrera our chairman as faculty and he had seen all my work with these other teams um and said you're when we needed uh, a chief medical advisor for USA Fencing, he was like, you're the one. You've been doing this. You've been establishing relationship with teams. You've shown your success in doing so. Um, so, you know, he didn't necessarily throw me into the leadership position right away, but he sent me on that first trip. On that trip, I busted my butt. I did everything, absolutely everything and anything those athletes needed, worked really well with our team, made sure I kept everyone in sync. And then USA Fencing actually reached out to him and said that they would like me to take the lead as the chief medical advisor through that. Thank you. Does that answer your question or? Yes. Clarify. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. 
You got it. Question, how, how important is it to have a, 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 a mentor who pours into you to make sure that you get those opportunities? Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely, is one of the most important things. And that's exactly how I made it too. I mean, um, Dr. Herrera, who I mentioned, like I said, took a chance on me three times and mentored me every step of the way. Um, and having that mentor that's already involved in those things, they've got their eyes on you. They're involved. If they see potential and they see promise, they're going to keep, you know, leading you in the right path, pushing you upward on your journey towards it. And in sports medicine, I'll tell you, we are all so passionate about what we do. We would love to mentor anyone who is, you know, looking to go on the same path. We're overly passionate about it. And you got to be, you got to be when you're in this world, right? You know, you got to know what it takes to be an athlete, right? Because the rigors that they're going through um, and you've got to love it and you've got to love the rigor and share it with them. So we are also passionate and we'd love to mentor anyone that was looking on this path. And it is of utmost importance at a really great point to make. And that's another way to make connections to Isaiah's question, you know, working with your mentor, um, having them put you in a room where there's hands to shake um, or even just watching them build their connections, how they do it. A lot to benefit from that. Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Miller. Thanks, Anthony. Hi, Dr. Zucker. Um, I joined a little bit late. So first of all, thank you for uh, your presentation. I, uh, I, I heard you mention uh, some work at Mega Harris College. And one of the goals of this initiative um, is increased diversity in, in the field of sports medicine. Can you talk about that experience at Mega Evers and how that came about? Sure. So how it came about a little bit before my time, I did my, I keep repeating myself here. I did my residency and fellowship here. Um, and the sports medicine fellows are the primary point of contact for, um, they're the team docs, if you will, for med grabbers. So when I was a fellow and a resident, that was my first encounter with them. Uh, we work with the athletic trainer and the um, athletic director there, and we do their pre-participation evaluations, whether we go on campus to do it or they come into the office. We uh, see them in training room. So training room is basically the athletic trainer. Any of them that are injured will go in to see him, and he will line them up for us once a week, you know, once a month, however much it needs, depending on the injuries, and we go and evaluate them with the um athletic trainer and give our recommendations and um, for for their injury and clear them to play or not clear them to play in some instances. So that relationship has been going on for some time now um, and definitely diverse uh, population of athletes that we see at Medgar Evers, um, which is so important to one, be prepared for, get used to, and be good at in sports medicine. You're going to see people from everywhere. And when I say from everywhere, I mean it. Like some of these are, are you know, international students coming in and it differs how you um, approach care and mentor these student athletes. You know, they're in a completely different world. They, everything is new to them. Um, and I take it, I, I take it as a personal responsibility to make sure that we don't just provide them with the right medical care, but make sure that they're in the safest environment they could be in um, and feel confident in where they are and what they're doing and confident in our care for them as well. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. No, it does. Just a quick follow up. So um, we actually don't have any programs at Mega Evers, um, but I'd like to uh, connect with them because one of the goals is to identify um, programs that have an athletic program. So one of the initiatives that we're working on is pairing medical schools with athletic programs in, in undergraduate schools to develop a pipeline of students into health professions. And we don't have a relationship like that with Medic Maker Everest. So I'd like to follow up with you to speak with your contacts there to maybe establish something around this, this initiative. Totally. I would love that. Thank you, Dr. Miller. So if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to come off mute and ask a question. And not seeing any, I have another question. In terms of um your participation with Team USA, do you have a um 
like almost a layout of your career path with Team USA? Is it going to expand or is it going to go somewhere else? Or are you going to just stay with uh, the Mount Sinai team? So I, uh, as as far as I see it, I'm with Sinai. Um, I love my position here. I love my job here. I love how mission driven our department is. Um, with Team USA, it is Mount Sinai that are the official medical providers. So my opportunity is through Mount Sinai and their relationship with Team USA. The way that it works with most NGBs or Olympic teams, it's year by year, the contract. Um, it's been very fulfilling and for both sides. So we don't see it changing. We do see us renewing our contract with them um, in the upcoming, at least until Paris. Um, and then hopefully until it's here in LA as well. Okay, thank you. If there's no other questions, I'll give another opportunity for anybody to ask a question. And I'm going to put my email up here too, just okay. for anyone who um, is interested in chatting more, any questions, or just wants to reach out. And I'm sorry, I think I interrupted somebody. Again, I, I apologize for joining late. We may have talked about this. So opportunities for shadowing experience with uh, Olympic teams, I'm imagining is very different than professional sports and such. So can you talk to us about how students would go about doing that and what that experience looks like? Yeah, sure. So a lot of our events are out of state, so it would require travel. Um, they're either out of state or out of country. The reason we don't have many tournaments in New York or New Jersey is the price of venues here. Uh, it's expensive. So they choose to have the tournaments in other states. Uh, however, we do have different fencing clubs here. And we are starting to get more involved with our local fencing club because 80% of our fencers are actually here on the East Coast. So we think getting down into that club level where they're fencing and competing in regional events um, is very important. So I think there would be an opportunity there for shadowing. And I am happy to speak to anyone who's interested. They could shoot me an email. I recall a story five or six years ago about a fellow, African-American fellow who um, was an Olympic fencer and started a program in Harlem. Are you familiar with this program? I don't know if it's, if you're talking, are you talking about the Peter Westbrook Foundation? It could be. <laughs> started a while ago, but I bet you five years ago, you saw a video about Daryl Homer, who's one of the athletes who became an Olympian at that time. And he's one of the Peter Westbrook Foundation athletes. Okay. Uh, Peter Westbrook, Coach Coach Westbrook is uh, incredible, and he started this uh, club for uh, minority fencers, and it's an expensive sport, and he knew that, so this was for those who, one, were minority, two, can afford it. Um, a lot of them became Olympians, a lot of them are currently Olympians, and it's right here in New York City, so a lot of pride in that. Um, so Daryl Homer, who he is from the Bronx, he grew up in the Bronx. He is a Toyota sponsored, you know, two-time Olympian now, uh, very, very talented fencer. He's, he's one who's really known from there. And another fencer who uh, is worth noting from Peter Westbrook is uh, Kamali Thompson, who just started her orthopedic um, surgery residency, just completed her first year um, after coming back as a training partner from Tokyo. So uh, a lot of great things coming out of Peter Westbrook, if, and I think that might be what you're referring to. Yeah, yeah. So where's this where's this person doing her residency? She's doing that at Temple in Philadelphia. At Temple, okay. Someone for us to reach out to us. As, as, Absolutely, well. she already knows about you. I sent you all the I sent her all the information once I got connected with you guys. Uh, she was going to join us today, but she she couldn't because of residency. But she would there's nothing I'm more sure of than she'd love to be part of an initiative like this. Okay, Anthony, you gotta follow up with her. <laughs> Definitely will. <laughs> and she has a brother who's a fencer as well, not in medicine, but we'll forgive him for it. He's also yeah. an old man. I mean, again, Peter Westbrook has a lot of great fencers came out of there. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. So if there's no more questions, we will say thank you so much for your time and your presentation. We greatly appreciate it.
Got and it. thank you all for coming to fill up the room and participate. With that being said, everyone have a wonderful night and get home safe. Thanks, everyone.